to close this meeting, and uh, I won't keep you here more than two hours. Um, obviously, since the topic of my thesis was disclosed, you'll see that I've wandered quite far uh, from that topic. Um, and certainly, uh, with all of the things that you heard that I'm doing, uh, will this advance? Um, you'll recognize immediately that I probably don't do much myself these days. And so the first thing that I must do is acknowledge all of the folks, at least uh, those who I believe uh, I'm showing data from. The folks in white are actually here. Marianne Martone, who you've heard from a few times, Jeff Grethy, Ilya Sosofsky, Stephen Larson, who had a very nice demonstration today, and Vadim uh, Askatov. But there are many other people whose names you recognize. If you see one of your slides here and your name's not on this list, please uh, come up to me later. So for uh, about 20 years now, I've been directing something called the National Center for Microscopy. And I think this is a good starting point for this talk. Um, this is a center supported by the NIH, sponsored by the NIH for technology development. It turns into kind of an incubator for technology development. In fact, for me, it's kind of a chop shop for electron microscopes, if you know that term. We get to modify, we get to order uh, specialized kinds of uh, columns and try and apply them or adapt them to help us image. We also, uh, in particular, Roger Chen and I, develop dyes and technologies for correlated light and electron microscopy. And down here in the lower right, if you can see that, we develop detector systems for those microscopes. So I'm going to try and go back and forth between what is my day job, which is the business of creating instrumentation to get new views into the nervous system, and what I've taken up uh, as kind of a social responsibility, and that's developing uh, a national informatics framework uh, with my colleagues, many of whom were on the slides. Part of the reason why this occurred, this kind of back and forth, was that when we started the National Center for Microscopy, it was about the same time that the National Science Foundation started the San Diego Supercomputer Center. And uh, I was going back and forth between those two activities and figured out that it was very useful with all the data we were generating and a lot of the computer graphics that we needed to do to utilize the supercomputers. So I got involved in that early. So the mission of the National Center for Microscopy is to work in what you heard about earlier as the mesoscale. I like to think that we coined that term. But what we define as the mesoscale is one nanometer to 100 microns. Can we go continuously across that range of scales? And here you see an array of images that came up uh, probably within the first 10 years of the National Center for Microscopy, a gap junction from Gina Sosinski, mitochondria I'll talk about electron tomogram of a synapse. That synapse would be about the size of the pointer on the end of that dendritic spine. The astrocyte we'll talk about shortly, and of course that's a Purkinje neuron, and that's cerebellum. That's my wife. This is non-invasive imaging. She's still alive. That's a proof that it's non-invasive. Um, I often uh, work on the plane on my slides. And when working on this particular slide uh, at some point, uh, I met a fellow who was working on a movie. This was about 11 years ago. The movie came out in 1999. And so the first uh, audience interactive opportunity is for you to tell me what movie it is. It starts in the middle of uh, the brain. This is 90 seconds, and it was $6 million. It was a $57 million movie. Uh, shh. So let's see if this will play. There's some sound. There you go. So this shows you starting in the middle of a synapse. So you see exocytosis, neurotransmitter going across the 50 angstrom synaptic cleft. As you pull back, you get uh, a view of spiny dendrites. These are from uh, early electron tomograms. And of course, as you've seen in more recent movies, uh, you can bring in the electrical activity as uh, flashing lights. So somebody besides Yuri, what movie was this? Yeah? Whose brain? 
So this is Edward Norton's brain, also Brad Pritt's brain. There we go, it's Fight Club. So this was being done uh, during a time when uh, there was some concern about uh, this kind of violence that the movie depicted. And uh, I had uh, to plead with the, uh, the producers to let me use a version of this movie. I promised that I would only show it in HDTV. I lied. The, uh, you're going to come out on a hair follicle here into a drop of sweat, and then it's on the eyebrows of this uh, character in the movie before the sweat drops on the barrel of a gun and he blows his brains out. I had to promise that I would show it in HDTV, and uh, the producer also said, well, Mark, you know, you were really interested in the astrocytes, but we had to take all the astrocytes out because there was no place for the camera. And hopefully before I'm done with this uh, presentation, you'll get a sense of how crowded the space is and uh, certainly something about the astrocytes. So if this is early 3D microscopy, this is modern 3D microscopy. This is the uh, largest electron microscope in the world. Here's a person for size reference. She's loading the sample. She has to leave the room. This is in, at Osaka University. And here's a five micron section of a spiny dendrite. We'll come back to that. Because, as uh, you heard in the introduction, these kinds of microscopes are rather rare and expensive. We started working uh, very early in our own uh, microscopy, actually, uh, in 1990, 91, on making the microscopes at the National Center available over the internet, even before the web browser, as you'll see in a moment. And we connected them rather directly to data storage and computation. So unknowingly, we kind of created the first distributed cyber infrastructure or a grid infrastructure as it came to be known later. And one can now, uh, although the cameras are not quite as fast as we'd like, operate from a sort of standardized interface, the microscope, uh, record data, push it to computational engines, uh, get a, a very quick tomogram to determine whether to move on. So that was the microscope in Osaka. Here's a similar one, slightly smaller in Korea. This is the Golgi apparatus in this case, at least the cis face. So you see we're stepping up in magnification. And basically the same interface works for modern light microscopes. This is one that we developed, Roger Chen and I did, with Nikon Corporation. It's a high-speed two-photon system. And in this case, we're looking at a living cell with a kind of dye that I don't have time to talk about that's compatible with both light and electron microscopy. So microscopes fill in this sort of middle area. You've got big instruments like synchrotrons that, or uh, NMRs that give you uh, structures. And then, of course, as you've heard uh, in uh, many of the talks during uh, these last uh, days, you've got non-invasive imaging that gives you another kind of data. So there's a continuum, if you like, a sedimentary layering of data types. And that's not the only data. We're enjoying a revolution now in uh, sort of the richness of data types that we can acquire. You heard about a lot of electrophysiological data today. Luckily, that revolution in the forms of data that we can acquire in biology and are acquiring is convergent with a revolution in our ability to deal with information. So just a little bit of background, just a few charts. Uh, genomes are rising rapidly with the reduction in the cost of sequencing to $1,000 for a full, full human duplex genome. There'll be 10,000 human genomes, probably 20,000 in about five years. Full duplex human genomes. What It costs cost $350,000 to do Jim Watson's. I don't know how much more it costs to do Craig Venter's. But we're going to have a huge amount of just genomic data. And that's just one piece of the omics. Um, the sort of next engineering level project in the omics, I think, is uh, structural biology. So of all the Lego pieces, the proteins, are meant to be characterized and put in data banks uh, in about 10 years. Okay. Uh, Burn, which I'll talk about briefly, has been pulling together information from, let's say, imaging as well as other areas, but we're already serving uh, quite a bit of data in the open. Um, as you can see, this is up at about 46 million files, uh, approximately 25 terabytes. So we're generating data much more rapidly, but I think we need to remember that the rate 
of generation is probably about the same as the rate we're losing it because we don't very, do a very good job of capturing it. Uh, so there, there have to be efforts, and I think this INCF uh, uh, organization is part of catalyzing this to begin to accumulate and share data more widely. Just to go back to something that John talked about yesterday, uh, what are the trends enabling? You heard about Moore's Law and what that means in uh, uh, the newer architectures. This is something from uh, uh, George Stix in 2001, and I promise you, even though this is uh, out to 2005, we've carried these out. Uh, the curves continue, as you heard yesterday, at least for that one. But more impressive exponentials are actually other uh, laws, if you like, or components, elements that uh, hold up modern uh, cyber infrastructure. The next one is the storage law. That says that if you have a one terabyte uh, generating project, which might cost you today $500, if you have $1,000 in your pocket, the $500 you don't spend to buy your terabyte will take care of that data in perpetuity because the cost is halving every year. The more impressive law, which I think drives the way we'll be operating more in the future, is the rate at which the bandwidth is increasing. And this isn't, doesn't require a lot of new fiber in the ground, it's just the style in which, the, the pattern in which you use it, the switch hardware. So that means, as you all know, uh, based on the telephones and PDAs and things you're carrying in your pocket, peripheral devices, you're connected, you're always aware, so how do we utilize this, the consumer electronics uh, impact uh, of all of this? So now going back in time, we started playing in this sandbox, if you like, with the NSF support of the sort of changeover from single site supercomputers to partnerships where they wanted to catalyze community, scientific communities utilization of this next generation of capabilities coming from the networking, coming from the computing, coming from the data. And so the project that I got involved with was uh, one of these NSF projects, large projects that replaced the supercomputer center funding. It's called the National Partnership for Advanced Computational Infrastructure. And what I got to do for helping to write that proposal was lead the neuroscience effort uh, starting in 1995. There was molecular science, earth sciences, and we were kind of coordinators of sub-disciplines of computer science, if you like, trying to say, here's the neuroscience challenge. How can we get uh, high-performance computing, middleware, what we now know as the grid, visualization environments and databases, which are sub-communities of the computer, science commu uh, 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 computer scientists working together so that we can do new things. One thing that we did, and David Van Essen was involved in this, is we set up data caches in two locations at WashU and UCLA and we asked uh, imaging neuroscientists, non-invasive imaging neuroscientists to put data in those caches and to see if we could move them and bend and blend the brains together using the supercomputers that we had in San Diego and elsewhere at the time in order to make comparisons. That project actually was a, a successful experiment, if you like, in at least bringing these communities together and trying to make a few uh, tools work. Uh, this is the NSF roadmap. I put this in for, for Kathy's uh, uh, benefit, sort of as a remembrance of, uh, she went a little farther forward. This was from the beginnings of the cyber infrastructure movement, but just so that some of you remember, one of the, the, the sort of key events was the NSF supercomputer centers, uh, uh, the one in Illinois, invented something called Mosaic, which became Netscape. Right, and that began to really open up the web. The um, term grid was invented right about the time of the Packy uh, competition. Larry Smarr actually came up with the term. He said uh, uh, meta computing is too complicated a term, so we need something that is like the power grid, so that, that term came up. And this is when the telescience, the telemicroscopy was, was uh, uh, set up. It was just ahead of the web browser. And so now the activity is what Kathy told you about is cyber infrastructure in Europe, but the same, same activity as e-science. And it's all over. The grid is the backbone for collaborative science and data sharing. Uh, each one of these is a you know, front-end website. Here's Burn. We'll talk about in a little while. EGEE -E -E is uh, one of the European efforts. 
So this is burn, which you've heard about. Uh, I'm not going to really go into a lot of detail here because I want to get into microscopy and my day job. But what we did starting in 2000, and we had this, uh, the, uh, a good portion of it up by 2001, is we used uh, gigabit uh, networks that existed in the U.S. at the time. And we linked sites that had agreed to participate as test beds or sort of glorified beta testers, if you'll allow me to say it in more pejorative uh, terms, who wanted to work on things like comparing data sets for uh, potential Alzheimer's patients or looking at schizophrenics with functional MRI or working across scales in uh, mouse models of neurodegenerative disease. Um, so these were meant to shape the NIH's effort to begin to collaborate across the boundaries of institutions, interdisciplinary collaborations and interinstitutional collaborations, and to promote data sharing. And I think it's been a success if, uh, for, with, under, for no other thing than just getting, let's say, half of this group as neuroscientists and half of this group as computer scientists, getting sort of a common language, getting them able to communicate. So this is our sixth annual all-hands meeting. Uh, we'll have our eighth annual all-hands meeting in October, and it's still going. What's under the hood? I won't go into the details, but for the user, there's a work facilitating portal which authenticates you, and then once you're authenticated, you're authorized to see whatever data someone has allowed you to see. It can be open and available to everybody, or it could just be some uh, data sets that are uh, being uh, uh, worked on between two groups. You have workflows, visualization, data analysis tools, as you've seen. And then in the middle, you have common tools that are used not only for burn, but used in other, other communities in uh, high energy physics or whatever. And at the bottom, you have these very big investments in high performance computing, big instruments, or big storage resources. Uh, the burn infrastructure, which took sort of the best of breed starting a few years ago and keeps uh, uh, evolving it, is now used in ocean observing systems. Uh, it's being applied to another big NSF project uh, on ocean systems. Geosciences, another NSF project. Um, marine uh, metagenomics or ecology, funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Uh, we're using burn infrastructure for that. There are other NIH grids, CA Big, not so much collaboration, but under something called uh, the Cardiovascular Research Grid, there is quite a bit of uh, uh, interaction. And then um, probably the most mature of these that's getting started is a national database for uh, autism research. So these are efforts in the U.S. that are using pretty much the same stack of cyber infrastructure that Byrne uh, put together. Here's a, at least one example of the way it's used. You go to a portal, you look at data that's distributed across all those sites on the, the map of the U.S., if you like, and you can push it to distributed computing resources. Uh, let's say a large-scale cluster in San Diego out to something called the TerraGrid in the U.S. The results, based on what the, the data type is, come back to some kind of a viewer. It could be an application that gives you charts and graphs or whatever, or it can be put in this uh, uh, tool from Brigham and Women's uh, called Slicer, where you'd be able to look at uh, anatomical data that might come back. Here's one example, a success story, uh, data from Wash U, uh, uploaded into the Burn repository, use a tool from uh, Harvard, uh, FreeSurfer, uh, to segment automatically, then some mathematical uh, geometries are calculated, some very interesting metrics using supercomputer and then visualized in the slicer. In this example, uh, it shortened the computation time to come up with hippocampal measurements. These were from uh, 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 demented or suspected uh, uh, different types of dementia patients. They were able to determine different types of uh, classes of dementia by just the, the morphometrics, if you like subtle shape changes of the hippocampus. And if you're interested in that, you can, you can find that paper in uh, PNAS. So again, typical image study before this kind of interest infrastructure was set up, centralized storage, modern way, what we call burn enabled. It's a, a multi-center imaging study. And we use this concept, we've 
pushed this concept from the beginning of our involvement in the Human Brain Project and then into Burn. Uh, you heard Henry pick up the term recently of a federated distributed database. How does that work? Well, in order to federate data, you need some sort of frameworks that help you link it together. And so we started with this idea of using a combination of semantic and spatial frameworks. So each site can develop their own database. We helped in many instances to sort of move them into a more modern way of thinking about databases. That was one of the functions of the Burn Coordinating Center in San Diego. And then help to create a common semantic hierarchy, if you like, or ontology, which we'll talk about a little more. And all the data elements are situated into a common spatial framework, well, an atlas in this case. And then an integration engine was built uh, called a mediator that allows you to navigate across uh, those types of data. So what's an ontology? I think you've seen enough posters and probably a quarter of the audience or 50% of the audience knows what this means at this point. Uh, but a brain has a cerebellum, has a Purkinje cell layer, et cetera, et cetera, linked by these kinds of terms, has a, is a, in a, which are machine readable. And so you might have an integrated view of one database or a merged view of databases that might look like this, a graph structure. You can't see that, you're not meant to. Um, but I think I can read some of this. Cerebellum has a cerebellar cortex, deep cerebellar nuclei, and you can just keep going down, linking ontologies all the way to genes. Here's a tool, actually Marianne Martone and Stephen Larson, who are the audience have been working on for going across scales and as you mark up, let's say this view of the cerebellum and you go from uh, a low magnification light microscopic view to a higher magnification view to an electron micrograph, you move through this graph structure of the semantic hierarchy or the ontology. And it's right there sort of in your face as you are marking things because the terms are, are there for you to pick, okay? When you're putting data into one of these frameworks, of course, you're required to find the term, just like I showed you on the previous uh, uh, page or slide. And you use a, a lexicon, and in this case, the burn lex, and you place it in an atlas structure. Here's an early version, still active. I think Ilya Soslavsky was showing uh, um, this in one of the demonstrations. Ilya's uh, a cartographer. We've uh, uh, adopted him as now a neurocartographer. And these are tools that came right out of the geospatial world. We put brains in geospatial uh, um, tools. And so you can click on this in an area and it'll go out to different sites and pull data. Here you see UCSD, Caltech, Duke, different types of data about the mouse brain in this case. So here's a little deepening. Here we're in the striatum. That's an area you're interested in. And here it's retrieving a neurolucida tracing of a striatal spiny neuron. And here in a sub area is an electron tomogram of that filled cell. So just to drive this point home, these modern federated distributed data environments, a user might say, give me images of the medium spiny neurons, track traces and histology of surrounding regions of the par uh, Parkinson's alpha-synuclein mouse model. It's an overexpressor of alpha-synuclein. And let's say that these four sites, microscopic MRI uh, with diffusion tensure imaging, high resolution uh, microscopic uh, MRI imaging, histology, this would be Caltech, this would be Duke, this would be UCLA, this would be San Diego. That question would cause the system to nibble little pieces of the appropriate data out of those databases and return the information to the user in a, in a useful way. This, this kind of thing has been up and working for quite some time in the burn environment. It's really uh, part of the basis for NIF, which uh, you saw a poster on. And one of the databases which uh, we, we use uh, in the laboratory and is a, you know, sort of the prototype of a federatable open database that Mary Ann has pioneered is the cell center database. You can go there and download images, uh, large brain images, whole cells, that's an Alzheimer neuron, uh, even uh, cyanobacter. Um, so these are just images you can, you can browse around, take them for free, use them, lots of people do. 
you heard about NIF. Uh, NIF is sort of the next generation of NIH investment in this kind of uh, uh, tool environment for linking neuroscience resources, the literature, data. Um, several in the audience here involved. Uh, Marianne is uh, leading this effort now. And I uh, suggest that you go and look at, at NIF and keep, keep looking at it. It's uh, an important thing, especially in the context of uh, INCF's activities. And it'll have organism, macroscopic anatomy, cell, neuroscience, uh, dysfunction, quality, and grow all the way down to uh, molecular descriptors, reagents. And underlying it is a very rich ontology which will grow, created from existing community resources. So I'm trying to move quickly because I really have three talks folded into one here and I want to let you get to dinner. Here's an example of the integration of multi-resolution data and this is going to allow me to dive down into some of the microscopy stuff, which as I said earlier is my day job. So here is MRI microscopy from Al Johnson's lab of uh, a mouse. And what we do is we nest multi-scale light microscopy in its proper location in these kinds of structures. We, we nest them together using atlas coordinates. How much data is it to make it useful? There are a lot of movements right now to map the brain at different, different scales. This is from uh, Harold Hess at uh, uh, Genalia Farms. Harold's a physicist. I uh, was surprised to see him uh, provide a slide that was a cube. It should have been a sphere. Um, but anyway, if you take a mouse brain and you assume that it's about a centimeter cubed, and you say, well, at the limiting resolution of light microscopy, how much data is it if you could map a whole brain, which you obviously could do with a, a, uh, an Allen Brain Institute level effort. It's about 30 terravoxels. One brain, one time point. Okay. Not really that daunting given the curve that I showed you earlier regarding the uh, lowering of the cost of data or uh, I mean storage and the idea that you'd use storage that was distributed. How would you get that data? Well, there are lots of techniques. One that we developed in the laboratory is this, as I said, this high-speed two-photon system. Well, not only is it great for live imaging, but since it's so fast, you can mount a, a whole brain on it and you can just let it go. It's stable. It'll run for days automatically and acquire an image like this. This is, uh, you know, 43 by 30 images, but it's uh, in depth and you can just keep moving up on it. This one actually is stained with quantum dots, so it's kind of permanently stained. Just keep moving up. Okay. And we've built in, in our laboratory what we call an interactorium. So we've got this big cluster-driven wall. Actually, it's a little bigger than this now. This slide's dated. Um, this is uh, another screen where you could pull up an individual neuron that would be filled within that kind of environment. It's actually a place that's, that's a lot of fun if you can get the data up on the wall to explore because you've got all these pixels of this large acquired data set uh, and you see things you really wouldn't notice. You see the details of a neuron down to the subcellular constituents that are fluorescent. In this case, it's IP3 receptor in green, by the way. So it's the ER that's delineated. And then you find patterns that you might not have noticed. Here's a slightly larger example. This is from the uh, Parkinson's disease alpha-synuclein overexpressor. This one's 100,000 images. And these are all posted. You can zoom on them kind of like Google Earth uh, on the website that I mentioned, the CCDB uh, database. We're posting these without publishing. I mean, our publication now in many instances is just this is data we think sh we should make available, and so it's there. Anywhere in a data set like that, you could have filled an individual neuron. This is a striatal spiny neuron. And looked at it in a different color. So this is conventional confocal microscopy. But for someone like me, who sort of grew up, grew up in uh, sort of the mid-life mid of uh, electron microscopy, uh, 
Light microscopy is wonderful, confocal microscopy, two photon microscopy is wonderful, but it's really not enough because the device physics, if you like, of the synapse, as you heard Mary talk about, really is very much at two levels down. The supermolecular complex is how they operate. And so you really need electron microscopy, as Kristen also showed, to look at this. And electron microscopy, of course, because of the shorter wavelength of electrons, gets you down. Light microscopy gets you down about to the size of a mitochondria, not to the details of a mitochondria. Well, if you wanted to map the wiring of the brain, and this is now a big uh, push to do this, which I think is great, you have to ask if you did a whole brain, mouse brain, at the resolution of electron microscopy required to see the 0.1 nanometer smallest processes, it's 30 petavoxels. 30 nanometers is about the thinnest section that you could practically uh, operate on. That's getting to be a reasonably big number, but still not that daunting, except how do you actually do it? So I guess you do it piecemeal. Different labs might do different parts, and if you have a, a connectable anatomy, you might be able to piece it together. We'll see. I think this will be the next big push. Um, we did pieces of this when I was much younger. So back in 1985, we did whole cells. We call these visible cells. This is uh, from biopsy samples of Alzheimer patients. So this is a cortical pyramidal neuron, nucleolus, nucleus, paratelical filament mass. These are now, we've resurrected these data from our old files, and they're available on the cell center database as well, a whole collection of these, these human neurons. So this is the way that uh, we used to do things, and it's still quite a valid way. You do serial section reconstruction. You trace the objects, as you saw elegantly done uh, in Kristen's work. You put a surface, a mesh on it. You render. This is uh, following the endoplasmic reticulum. This is uh, work Mary Ann did, I won't say how long ago. Now we're pushing, we have been for about 15 years, uh, to higher throughput this electron tomography that I showed you an image of, uh, where each section is treated as a volumetric entity. Um, the smallest constituents in cells reveal secrets or uh, things that we didn't expect. You take a mitochondria you thought was a solved structure, you tilt a half micron section in the electron micrograph, take the images and then uh, segment in the same way that you saw neurons segmented. And you see that the textbooks are wrong. The Christi don't end in baffle-like enfoldings, they end in little tubules. And this is across nature. So it's something that was just missed because of the projection misinterpretation of thin sections from early electron microscopy. Because these tubules are just about a third of the thickness of the thinnest sections. So people just misinterpret them, misinterpreted them. So these are the new models that come from. So about anything that's in that fine tubular size domain is being reinterpreted from early electron microscopy by tomography. Even spiny dendrites look different. So this is now using this three million volt, this unique microscope in Osaka, kind of like a big light microscope with high resolution. This is a five micron thick sample. Selectively stained, it was filled. And you can see all the spines that were traced out in this and surfaced. For those uh, 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 computational neurobiologists, look at that dog leg. That's not an artifact. Model that, guys. I mean, this is, when, you, when you really do a lot of these reconstructions, you see some peculiar things, uh, anastomotic dendrites. They don't taper uh, quite the way you're led to draw them from uh, light microscopic le uh, level resolution. I bet that Kristen would uh, agree with me. And also, look at the diversity of spine shapes and links. It'll get more interesting. So this is, again, with this big fancy microscope, of which there are one. And what we've been doing is trying to enable uh, microscopes that can be at regular universities, albeit a bit expensive, to do things that are close to this. In other words, work with very thick sections. It's kind of the counterpoint to my colleagues who do cryo-EM for molecular 
imaging. I call them born-again crystallographers. We're trying to continue with this notion of having an electron microscope that's a super light microscope, if you like. So here's our newest microscope, a little $4 million piece. It's a FEI Titan. Actually, it's in a box. You don't get to sit at it. You open the box, you see a mass of wires. You get to sit over here at a console. It's an extension of the telemicroscopy concept. But here's a two micron section of something that was uh, selectively stained. Uh, it's just going to go up in magnification, spiny dendrites. As we play a little bit with the contrast and zoom up, you'll see, oh, now we're going through the tomogram as a deck of cards. You'll see these are synaptic vesicles. So you see this little mushroom spine, certainly looks like a mushroom. So this happens pretty quick with a microscope like this. This is actually with scanning transmission EM tomography, dark field. So something new. So you can keep going. So spiny dendrite from the 3 million volt microscope, uh, this is from uh, Alan Barrett's and uh, uh, Richard Weinberg's work, presynaptic uh, material associated with exocytosis. In one of those uh, slices through a tomogram, there's a filament. That's an actin filament. You can actually fit the solved structure of actin. Okay. So again, we're doing molecular anatomy on top of well-preserved uh, structures in electron tomograms. So that means, I think, we can eventually build a brain of visible cells at the molecular level. So if microtubules are your target, you try to do this at 10 nanometers resolution. Actually, microtubules are kind of big. They're 250 angstroms. We're actually interested in getting to about 1 nanometer resolution, which we think we can do in these volumetric reconstructions through whole cells. How much data is that? You saw this term in, in one of Henry's slides. It's a zetavoxel. He was talking about zetaflops. This is a zetavoxel to do a mouse brain at this resolution. Well, of course we're not going to do a mouse brain at this resolution, but we can start cell type by cell type, at least doing the perikaryon, the cell bodies, at this resolution, and the major pieces, the, the proximal dendrite, the apical dendrite, the nodes of Ranvier, and the like, and place the molecules that are useful in simulations in the context. So paint and decorate. And we'll come to that in a minute in the same way that Mary talked about with at least one example where electron tomographic data was used in an M-cell simulation, if I have time. In order to get to where this data can be reliable, we had to develop a technology that allowed us to have quality of preservation that was equivalent to freezing from life. In other words, like cryo-EM. Okay, high pressure freezing, free substitution. What we determine, and you can see this is recent, 2008, is that the fixation, the glutaraldehyde perfusion fixation, if you do it right, doesn't do any damage at all. I can even show you virus structure inside of cells where you can see the details of the virus matching the crystallographic structure after aldehyde. The deleterious effects, the damage or the reduction in quality in electron microscopy appears to come from the dehydration and embedding. And if you do that process by taking the, let's say, a vibratome slice of a fixed preparation, high pressure freezing it and free substituting it, you get this kind of structure, cerebellum, uh, cerebellar uh, spines. Uh, this is uh, inside of a Purkinje cell. Here are nodes of Ranvier. Those of you close to the front can see detail here in the the junctions between the myelin and the axon. Here's a tomogram, just a deck of cards type preparation. You can get down to the level that I believe that uh, Mary wants to get to where we can see the receptors, we can see the cam kinase if we knew what they were. If they stood up and said, I'm a you know, boxy looking you know, uh, uh, supermolecular complex of cam kinase. It's all available in here. You have the resolution. How do you stain it? How do you label it? Well, again, I don't have time to go into this whole story, but this is what one of the things that we've been doing at the National Center for some time is, is trying to come up with ways that are higher resolution than immunogold, where we paint a molecule, we put a blanket of density and identifiable 
atomic uh, uh, density around a molecule. So one of the easiest ways that we found to do this that's really rather high resolution is something called fluorescence photoconversion. That's where you use singlet oxygen that comes from a label on a molecule to paint the molecule by depositing diaminobenzidine around it, like a, a negative stain in situ. So the easiest molecule to do that with is tetrabromofluorescein, which is eosin. And just to prove that this works, here's an acetylcholine receptor. Of course, this is a model. It has two alpha subunits. Each one binds alpha bungrotoxin. You can put eosin on alpha bungrotoxin. It's fluorescent. You can look at it in the fluorescent microscope. I'm not going to show you those slides. Here's acetylcholine receptors. This is purified from torpedo californicus in membrane. That slide's 25 years old. That's the pore down the middle. Here's something more recent. That's the acetylcholine receptor in a neuromuscular junction. So this is like my thesis work, I'm sorry. Um, in situ. So we painted single molecules and it's really specific. Well, that's great. We don't have too many irreversible toxins that we could derivatize that way. There are a few other molecules you can do. You can do phalloidin and do actin and spines. Here's a Purkinje cell. This is phalloidin, uh, in this case, uh, fluorescein. If you use uh, a photoconvertible fluorophore on phalloidin, this is what the spines look like. Phalloidin binds to actin. So that's the actin, guys. So remember, all these static electron micrographs, you're parts while you're thinking or learning or whatever are moving around a little bit, right? Someone calls you muscle head, say thank you. I mean, that's part of our problem is all of this static electron microscopy has lost the dynamics. We don't have an appreciation of the dynamics. This is just one more image of, you can see individual actin filaments with this technology. And it's, of course, been mapped in spines. Uh, this is uh, from work of uh, Francisco Capani. This is a spine apparatus. That's the postsynaptic density. Those are cables of actin actually go from the lamellae between the elements of the spine apparatus to the uh, postsynaptic density. But again, neurons are not everything. I promised you a little bit on astrocytes. I'm going to do that quickly. I am going to go over time, I apologize. So neurons are noisy. We listened to them. We had a whole day on the activity of neurons. I have to give the glia a little bit of time. They're 50% of the brain volume, 90% of the cells in the brain. Oops. Uh, they're the Rodney Dangerfield cells. They don't say anything, so you really don't listen to them. Right? However, Virtually every synapse, not every, but most, have some astrocyte processes, some glial processes. It's well known that they have uh, vesicles, release neurotransmitter, have neurotransmitter receptors. More interesting, the evolution of the nervous system reflects an increase in the ratio of astrocytes to neurons, from leech to human, and there are outstanding examples in nature. Okay, Real paper, guys. This is Marion and, and, and uh, Diamond and Arnie Scheibel. They had, like some others, pieces of Albert's brain, and apparently, according to this, he had more astrocytes. Well, astrocytes were, are really kind of one of the not only underappreciated, but underrepresented cells. So this is an astrocyte drawing from the last, uh, I guess, the century before the last century. What Eric Bouchong in the lab did um, was filled astrocytes in slice preps, dead slice preps, but still with the membranes uh, uh, non-permeable. And we found that astrocytes that were filled in their entirety versus the glial fibrillary acidic protein stained astrocyte, which was the model of the astrocyte, was about 85% larger there was more of it. Same mag. Here's a little movie. This is what an astrocyte really looks like. 
We published this. A lot of people didn't believe it now in the Brainbow Animals from Jeff Lickman. This is obvious. It's all over. And the story gets even more interesting. So, by the way, this is the GFAP view of the astrocytes in the brain. Here are three that were filled, these shrubs. The next question that we asked is how do they relate to one another or to neurons? Of course, here are the neurons, the noisy guys, right? Here are two astrocytes near one another. Here, just so you can see, that's counterstaining with GFAP, so you see the internal intermediate filament based cytoskeleton. So here's the model in the literature. It's like pine trees in the forest, the astrocyte processes interdigitate. Totally wrong. If you take one filled astrocyte that's green and several around it, and you put a half micron Gaussian blur on the two colors and ask where do the voxels interact, you find that there's a surface convoluted like the coast of England, but definite surface that uh, means that these cells tile in unique domains. So this is the new model for how astro astrocytes parcelate the brain. And in the hippocampus where this was done, Kristen's numbers tell you that there are about 120,000 synapses in the domain of one astrocyte. Okay. I like to think of the neurons as the trees in the forest and the astrocytes as the caretaker of the forest. Okay, the forest is extremely well gardened or managed. So I think you have to think about the astrocytes as telling the neurons when to connect, how to connect, when to call in microglia to clean up on too many connections. So more attention needs to be paid to the astrocytes. Now to try and wrap up a little bit. So I've shown you that we use light microscopy and electron microscopy to create these multi-scale models. We feed them in ways that uh, uh, you saw from Mary into models that are used for simulation. We work very closely with Terry Sanofsky uh, and Tom Bartle have for years. Uh, one success story was to use uh, serial electron tomography. So this is a hybrid of electron tomography, this volumetric representation and serial sectioning to reconstruct large pieces of ciliary ganglion neurons. That's a long story, I'll make it short. Um, in addition to painting and decorating that surface for understanding how the different frequencies of activity might affect the way the postsynaptic cell operated, we started to do simulations on what happens when you release neurotransmitter in different places. We assume the neurotransmitter was releasable because we could see vesicles within a half diameter or attached to the presynaptic membrane and they weren't just in regions where you found a postsynaptic density where we knew one type of acetylcholine receptor was. So we supposed that something else was going on because there was a lot of physiology that was a little bit confusing. And so this is a simulation. Uh, this relates to a paper that I'll show you was published in 2005 in Science. Again, similar to what Mary showed with the release of neurotransmitter. Here we're not interested in the uh, the EPSP or the calcium transients, just what's happening when vesicles are released outside of where we knew to be one of the types of acetylcholine receptors. So this is an early example of uh, the M cell simulation, in this case applied to uh, an electron tomographically defined subsurface. So the take home message in this was that we demonstrated, if you like, that uh, ectopic neurotransmission occurred at a neural synapse, just based on simulation in this case. It was the only thing that matched the physiology. So I, I point you to that paper. So we continue to boldly go. Um, this in a way is pointing, letting you know where we're going, but reminding you of the, 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 the size of the challenge. This is a slide I used at the neuroscience meeting, so it's a little bit San Diego based because that's where the meeting was. But if you take that range of magnification that's required for the wiring diagram and you go from the whole mouse brain to the smallest wires that you need to follow, 0.1 micron, it's roughly equivalent to going from looking at the entirety of uh, 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 North America to be able to read the license plates on all of the cars in North America, if North America were a th was really three-dimensional. That's the range that we need, okay? 
trying to give you something to, to actually understand the, the range of magnifications and dimensions we need to deal with. And that doesn't get you to, you know, Mary Kennedy's super molecular complexes at all. You need two orders of magnitude at least of greater detail to do that. Well, we're going to do this piecemeal, and we've started something called the uh, Whole Brain Catalog, the Whole Brain Project. And uh, this is at least one of our construction uh, uh, tools uh, that you'll see. And uh, Stephen Larson uh, showed you a poster with uh, more of this. I hope this plays. But this is a graduate student uh, in the lab, Iman Mustafi, uh, in computer science. And we're just sort of clipping through some of the different types of data sets that I showed you to an electron tomogram, down to a, uh, a mitochondria. And you can see what Iman is doing here on this uh, two-dimensional panel display. He's flying in, he's moving around. You can do this in a shared environment. These screens are in multiple places. His avatar was that biplane. Okay, and these panels represent uh, uh, terminology that he can use to, to paint or assign. Now he's in a new kind of display. This one's pretty expensive. It's semicircular and it's three-dimensional. He's just looking into this world, comes around like this. It's about 60 panels. And it knows where his eyes are and he's seeing 3D. And so he's able, with his wand, to pick things up. He's inside a dendrite. He's placing mitochondria. So he's interacting with the multi-scale scene. He's inside of it. Now, of course, this is an expensive environment. It's an experimental environment. But in just a few years, this will be one of your appliances. I mean, you'll have these kinds of capabilities in devices that you'll use to, to play. And uh, hopefully everybody will be able to participate in their free time in taking their data and putting it in the context of this uh, shared virtual brain world that we hope to develop in the whole brain catalog. Does it look like fun? I have to run the credits. It's right, it's just two seconds. I can't do this without letting everybody know who did this. But you can see you can put labels on. Suppose we could make it talk to you. When you touch something, it would tell you what you've just touched and go to the uh, the NIF repository. And these are the people involved in that. So unlike the whole brain catalog, which cost you $4 in 1969, this will be free. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I think we, have, we have very appreciate you take us to the brain microcosmic world. And uh, since uh, the organizer told me that the time is very sharp, so unless if you have a different question, maybe I can take one or so. Is there no, anybody have? Uh, we still have a time. We have a full dinner time tonight, so on the boat. So let me thank together again to Mark. Have a great talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>